that's it. All righty. I believe we're live, guys. Welcome to the Business of Property on Property Development Australia. Mark Greenberg, Ben and Michael from Lambert Capital are joining us tonight to talk about the cool and sexy topic about property development lending. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Hey, Cheryl. Hello. Hi, Cheryl. Hello. Um, I, I, I sense a lot of excitement from, from tonight's session uh, because, as you know, in the community that we have, uh, it's a hot topic when we talk about lending. Any questions about lending? Who, who's doing lending? What sort of lending? Um, often Mark's there with his little comments and everyone's going, oh, Mark's spoken. <laughs> it must be gospel. Um, so before we go down that, I'd love for, for you to sort of um, introduce yourselves and what Lambert Capital do. So I believe, Ben, this is over to you. By the way, happy birthday. 25 Thank again. Thank you. 25 <laughs> again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so Lambert Capital um, core business is property development finance, where our main business is where um, people seeking preferably development finance, whether that's for two townhouses, five apartments, up to 60 townhouses. Um, looking to fund those transactions. So, so our core business is, is lending into developments which have a clear exit strategy, which means that um, if we're putting uh, a client into a trend, uh, into a deal that we can get repaid. And that's usually by um, the uh, settlements of uh, pre-sales or that is the refinance by an um, alternative investor or lender. Um, so we look at deals primarily in the first mortgage space up to a 65% LVR. Um, LVR is defined as a loan to valuation ratio, which means you take the, the, the value, which is put on by a valuation, a valuer, which is done for first mortgage purposes. And you can just multiply that by 65%. And that is for our construction lending, where we look at things like who the developer is, uh, where, what they've done before, the location, the builder, um, the exit strategies, as I discussed before, the level of pre-sales, um, and, and then we do our analysis, and then we will um, present that to our investment committee for, for funding, and they will, they will tick that off. So, as I said before, our loan sizes that we look to do with developers are probably from the $2 million to $30 million uh, mark for senior debt lending. We also um, do mezzanine lending as well on top of that, which is bridging the gap between the senior um, and the developer's equity and, and and which is called mezzanine finance. There is another thing in the capital stack, which we call preferred equity, which we can discuss later on, but our core business is, is property development finance. Um, you know, a bit about Lambert Capital. We've been around doing lending for 15 years, the last 15 years. Um, and we have, you know, a long, a long track of delivering uh, positive outcomes for our borrowers. Um, we have a very experienced team with Mark here, uh, Michael and Daniel. Um, we will um, be able to assess and do a high level of due diligence. So a deal will come in and we'll be able to analyse it, um, doing it doing a strong feasibility analysis and determining um, you know, the, the gross realisation value, um, the cost of the development and working out what the project related site value is for construction finance and ensuring that the deal has uh, a sufficient return on cost. And we work on uh, about that 20% return on cost. We look at deals from land, apartments, townhouses, commercial, industrial. Um, we have a deep market knowledge um, and we understand um, good opportunities uh, within the property um, market. Um, we're able to identify the right property transactions and being able to help our borrowers, um, you know, secure finance at the most um, cost-effective way. Um, the difference between us um, is speed and certainty. So if you come to land the capital, we'll be able to deliver um, uh, a solution um, within a very, very quick turnaround time and be able to provide our borrowers with letters of offer 
within you know, 48 hours of uh, presenting them with our mandate agreement. Um, we do, as I said before, we do um, a lot of due diligence um, to make sure that the uh, deal falls into our uh, a checklist. We have thorough, thorough checklists there. Um, and we, we don't take on um, a lot of deals, but we, we try and take on quality um, over quantity, which is our mantra um, at Lambda Capital. From the investor side, um, you can rest assured that we act on behalf of um, a lot of high net worth individuals, family officers. We have our own balance sheet up to um, $5 million um, where we, we sort of um, invest that into small mezzanine pieces um, and equity um, as well, um, and some small senior debt opportunities um, there. So, you know, some benefits to uh, investors out there who are looking to invest their money, um, able to get um, strong risk risk adjusted returns, um, instead of getting 1% um, on your money in the bank, you're able to get eight, nine, 10%, even higher than that for um, construction finance, where there is some sort of um, trick in it, whether it's um, a higher LVR, whether the uh, pre-sales have sunset clause issues, they're about to expire, whether it doesn't have any pre-sales into the mezzanine territory, which will allow you to get a higher return, um, closer, um, you know, greater than 12. So the mezzanine returns looking from up to 20% return per annum on your money. Um, and then if you want to take equity risk, which is up to the you know, 24 to 30% return per annum, um, which we do see um, a lot of those transactions. Um, so what we can um, promise our investors is we have a good access to ongoing deal flow, the land, apartments, townhouses, and commercial. We filter a lot of deals. We have a strong pipeline of good quality opportunity to go right now. Um, we will provide a full end-to-end -end service where we do, as I said, we do detailed executive summaries on the transactions, recommending as to why you should invest in the transaction, feasibility analysis, cash flow, presentation, background research. We also do loan as well. On their behalf, um, where we will draft it um, and take it all the way through um, to settlement and then um, on uh, ongoing maintenance. Um, we also give monthly project updates, which a lot of our investors like, um, and we, we can manage the, the QS if it's a construction program manage the QS and make sure that if they're falling behind, we're putting in adequate measures to make sure that the project's finished online and within budget. We also have another iteration of Lambda Capital, which Michael's come on board, which is Lambda Capital Developments, where we are currently involved in several joint ventures um, and you know, namely two townhouses up to 400 lots land subdivision in Ballarat. We're also involved in a commercial project in Collingwood. So we're, we're applying our finance knowledge and we're putting it into our development um, arm of the business as well, um, where we're trying to pick um, up opportunities that we see um, in the market and, and take advantage of that, um, of, our, of our knowledge base. So that's another opportunity for people who might have land and they're looking for um, a, a joint venture quote unquote partner or a partnership where we can bring the capital um, and the, the project management skills, the delivery, and they can put their land in and, and we can help them deliver um, a return as well. So we, we sort of do a, quite a lot at Lambert Capital um, and we like to um, provide a high level of excellence um, in everything that we do, do at Lambert Capital. So that, that's a quick overview. That was a quick overview. <laughs> I think you answered all my questions, Ben. So I'm going to go now. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very, very comprehensive overview uh, of what you guys do. And I've got a few questions sort of popping, popping up. But even before I even get to that point, um, I want to step back a little bit as to the lending environment um, that has sort of changed over the last sort of three to five years, you know, five, even a little bit more, everyone was going to the banks. Everyone was going to the banks. It was great times, um, low rates and everything else. And then the banks started clamping down, 
making it more difficult to to get finance and that's when sort of private lending has become um probably the first choice like you know, I'd, I'd say the swing has absolutely um, changed towards private lending. Talk us through just the just sort of lending, you know, private lending 101. What are the benefits of going to a private lender like you guys as opposed to the big fours or even the second tier lender? So I think um, I think I'll give Ben a break. It is his birthday today, so thanks Ben for uh, for coming on and, and sharing that information with us. Um, I think uh, yeah, private lending probably has kicked off um, post uh, the GFC, and then probably in the last three to five years again has probably increased even further. There's just, there's a lot of cash um, sitting in there in bank accounts, and as interest rates go down, um, there's more supply coming into the market, so people are trying to attract a you know, a higher return on their their funds. Uh, there's been a lot of overseas money that's coming to Australia as well. Um, and I think the banks have just been more and more conservative. Um, the, there was a lot of um, external influences, APRA, those sort of things, cracking down on construction lending, which then um, meant that uh, they were, rather than saying no to a deal, they were just making it harder for people to actually borrow. So that might be putting up um, higher debt cover ratios, asking for 100% debt cover, um, saying things like, you know, we'll reduce the, the LVR down to 60%. Um, interest rates were, were low, so, so people were still trying to go to the banks. And, and we actually like it when people have gone to the banks and they have been knocked back and it might take them three or four months. So though I guess our value proposition is more speed, certainty. Um, we can, you know, we know exactly what our investors' appetite is. Um, if it's our own money, our own family office, um, my family's money, or if it's, um, some of the high net worth people we represent. Um, we also uh, look after three or four of um, you know, BRW top 200 families with their funds. We um, often invest in syndicates with them, manage their funds. So, so it's just it's just a, a more flexible, um, a quick quick uh, uh, decision process, and that's what that's why people come to us. Yeah, and and it also it seems a lot more people are wanting to get into the investing side of things like more lenders and everyday lenders want to get into this space because for a long time I mean I don't think most people thought they would be a lender in a, in a development project yeah so I think um, th there's always been mortgage funds um, that people have invested mm -hmm. in so smaller investors so the mum and dad investors that are invested either through their super funds or their own personal um cash that they've got sitting in term deposits and as, as rates were coming down, this is more attractive for people to put into those sort of funds. Um, our, our business, I guess, is slightly different because it's more a matching process where we'll take one um, investor that might have $5 million and match them with another um, borrower that wants to borrow $5 million. So it's not, it's not a syndicate. It's not, um, you know, 15 people putting in $50,000 each. It's, it's one investor putting in, 6.3 million or 10.3 million or um, some of the larger deals were done, which had you know, been pushing up into that 21 million, 26 million, 30 million sort of space. Um, but yeah, the average sort of um, investor is putting in maybe one, two, five million dollars into, into one transaction. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and that sort of answers one of the questions there, you know, what level of investment funds would you take? Do you take it in a hundred grand, you know, hundred grand blocks, which I'd say, doesn't sound like it really you want one invest one investor one project yeah traditionally it's been say one high net worth in individual and might say okay we'll put five million dollars into one transaction um there are smaller deals some of the second mortgage deals might start at the maybe 200 250 up to say five million dollars mm -hmm. um but yeah we've done we've done some you know um preferred equity pieces, um, mezzanine finance, second mortgage stuff at around that million dollar, $2 million mark. Um, but yeah, traditionally it's been, I mean, if we talk about recent transactions, um, they'll probably be in that sort of five to $15 million space. Yeah. With one, and, and, and usually it's one investor. Yeah. All right. Um, and yeah. we talk about this thing about being a matchmaker to a certain extent. And I remember mm -hmm. speaking to you last week about how it was also about finding the right investor for the right project. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's sort of, you think it's about it's like a, 
cut out of it there. So I'm not sure I missed that. But yeah, I oh, think. Yep, you're um, back. Yeah. So so um, it, it, if you think about it, it's like a it's like a financial advisor. So um, you know, we're talking to our investors and asking what their risk appetite is. So some people only want to invest in first mortgages. Some people have to put their money into a second mortgage. Some people would prefer, you know, like happy to take some more equity type risk. The traditional investor is probably a bit more conservative, just looking for a, you know, a 60, 65%, maybe 70% LVR. Um, and so we know what their appetite is. Um, it's mainly in Melbourne. So it's, um, it's Melbourne based investors that prefer to invest in Melbourne projects, but they will go to Sydney or Brisbane, um, capital city um, locations. But some people might be as specific to say they only want to do um, townhouses in Melbourne, or they only want to do um, land subdivisions, or they only want to do a single house, or they're happy to do, um, you know, office buildings, or they like commercial. So the, every um, investor will have their own appetite, and then our process is then to say, okay, if we find a deal that meets your criteria, and we bring it to you, we expect you to be able to give us a quick answer, and usually that's a you know 24, 48 hour process. And that allows us to um, deliver on the value proposition, which Ben alluded to earlier, which is um, speed to market and certainty. So if we issue a letter of offer on behalf of our uh, investor, then that's backed up with, with their funds ready to um, mm. deploy. And, and because they've got their money usually sitting in the bank and it's earning you know, 1% in a, in a cash management account or in a term deposit, they're very keen to get the money out very quickly. Yeah. Um, and often we have to slow them down that, you know, some of them would like to, you know, pay the builder quickly, which we also like to do, but, um, there's a process to go through and, you know, Ben alluded to earlier again, in terms of the quantity surveyor reports, um, yeah. we do site inspections, we do the loan management, we go out on site, we attend the PCG meetings. Um, so there's a, there's a process before we can just release the funds. And so when does it, does it go to an investment committee first before it goes to the lender? Uh, so it depends on who the lender is. So obviously, if we're the lender, then I guess the investment committee is us. So um, if it's my family's money, the investment committee might be my father and myself. So it's not a very big investment committee. Um, um, and then depending on who the investors are, so we know what their appetite is. It might be as simple as just a phone call. Um, some, some just like a quick one-page email. Others like a 15 page executive summary before they'll look at it. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the family offices have their own in-house investment committees. Um, some of them we share offices with, so we can walk down the, the corridor and, and you know, submit it to them. Um, others have their own uh, in-house legal team or their own um, you know, due diligence processes. Um, but yes, yeah, so every investor is slightly different. Okay. And so uh, talking about Melbourne, how have, has things changed in the last six months with the lending? Um, the lending, I think, I mean, Ben, you might want to comment as well, but I think we've had a pretty steady inquiry um, of transactions to look at. The quality sometimes is, well, you probably see 15, 20 deals a week. I don't know what you think, Ben, but um, there's been- I think, I think, yeah, over the, the, the last six months, um, especially obviously with the COVID, the, the novel COVID-19 virus, they call it, in the valuations uh, that we read. But um, I think gearing levels um, have definitely come back. I think before late last year, um, you know, probably last year, um, a lot of investors were prepared to stretch um, the LVR higher with less debt coverage. Um, it has definitely come back now um, to have appropriate level of debt cover. Um, and, you know, I dare say the banks are even, even less at the moment. Um, yeah. So where we would be at 65 to 70, um, last year we might be at 60 now. Um, so it's just, it, th that's what we've seen. We've seen rates, uh, private lender rates, probably maybe slightly increase of recent times. Um, it's not meaning that they can get away with achieving those rates, but they'll definitely start higher um, and it'll be up to Mark and I and, and Michael and Daniel Lambert to make sure it's a fair uh, deal for both borrower and investor. Um, so we'll price it for risk. Um, Pre-sales obviously have come back, they're slower. Um, and so you just have to be able to mitigate it with maybe additional security, um, 
appointing the right civil works contractor and or builder to make sure it gets built. So I think the due diligence that we were doing is still there. Um, so deals that we, we were doing pre-COVID, we're still doing now because our, our, our checklists have not changed. Um, whereas some people's were maybe a bit more relaxed before and, and saying, well, we'll shut up shop until we get the everything that looks normal again, um, which okay. wasn't the case for us. So we're still seeing city inquiry, knocking back um, a lot. Um, but also funding a lot as well um, and confident. Um, you know, you've got to be confident, um, which we are. So, I mean, if you like the transaction um, and the, the principles are, are sound, um, why not? Why not? What, you know, why not do the transaction? And we talk about confidence. Oh, I'm getting a bit of feedback there. Um, is it confidence in the long-term view of the property market? Yeah, I think, I think supply and demand from the property market. I think the deals that we're doing, strong fundamentals in terms of the locations that we're funding, whether it's land as well, whether you've seen the, the stimulus packages come in and the, the, the help boost that. Um, it's confidence that Lambda Capital will back the right transactions. So that's from an investor point of view, gives them confidence. And from a borrower's point of view, if we like the transaction, we believe in the transaction, which will give them confidence um, in it. It's over, over over market confidence. We couldn't specifically talk about the market. I mean, no one can, but yeah. we can mm -hmm. talk about specific projects and specific locations that we would like to invest in and, and, and our property asset class as well. Excellent. Okay. Um, I've got a question about feasibilities here. So Peter's asked, in regards to feasibility, do you take into account our feasibility or disregard it altogether and do your own and assess the project <laughs> based on your numbers? Good question. I think it's a bit of both. I, think, I mean, we're, in terms of feasibility, I've, I mean, at Lambda Capital and myself personally, we've been using the same uh, Excel spreadsheet for about the last, uh, what, well, since about 2007, so about 13, 14 years. So we like to use our own format. Um, we, we, we do appreciate when... People have done their own um, due diligence and if they can support it with rates per square metre, um, what they think they can build it for, but we'll also make our own assumptions. So we've got plenty of um, history, a lot of valuations, uh, access to construction costs in-house with Michael and, and Daniel coming from a construction background as well. Um, so we will stress test it ourselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a bit of both. And then ultimately it's going to be also driven by what the value is going to help us with in terms of their feasibility. So there's probably a few different versions of it. And then some of the investors um, also have their own viewpoints on on certain asset classes and, and what they think is possible as well. So um, particularly now, if pre-sales are a bit um, harder to get, we're going to yeah. even do more due diligence on some of the assumptions. So. Um, and so with valuations being at, saying it's a property and a project in Melbourne, um, and often valuers will, will value it as is in the current market, which in Melbourne, um, you're going through something at the moment. So how, how much do you rely on that particular sort of valuation? As in, in, as in current, current rates? Current rate, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're still looking for pre-sales. We're still looking for comparables. Um, I think that some of the, some of the things that have happened is maybe what Ben said earlier as well, in terms of um, maybe being a bit more conservative on the, um, the valuation be a bit more conservative on the LVR um, and also just picking the right project. So if it's in the affordable housing sort of space, if it's townhouses, if it's um, a land subdivision, something that we can actually stage, which then de-risks the project as well. So we'll take a bit more, um, we'll, we'll be a bit more aggressive, I guess, on, on those sort of assets as opposed to maybe, you know, the high rise apartments, which we don't tend to fund. Mm. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm going to go back to, all right, people are wanting to get things funded. Um, what do they need to prepare uh, to be able to put an application across to you guys for consideration? Um, well, Just a few uh, things out of your checklist, few, I guess. A few things on the checklist. Well, the, the number one thing, I guess, is who the, the sponsor, who the, the guarantor, who the developer is who, as a person. Um, because we're lending our own money, uh, we're, we're lending mum and dad investor type money. Um, they want to back the person who's going to deliver the project. 
So that's that's probably the number one. Um, apart from all the basics. So like, just on that, yeah. Sorry, just on that, Mark. What yep. sort of format should they should that present be presented in? In like a so uh, a, a resume or. Yeah, it's, it's more like yeah, the the relevant experience. So if it's if it's um, if they're building townhouses and they've never done that before, that's that's an issue. If they if they're saying they want to do um, an apartment building with you know ten levels with a three level basement and they've only ever done you know a dual lock before, uh, that's a big step up. So we'll then have to try and mitigate that risk if we're going to take it on because it might be a you know might have a very good builder. We might suggest they um, need some external project management advice, some help, or they might engage Lambert Capital Developments internally to, to help out. Wait, wait. Um, but yeah, so so and then it comes down to things like net assets, um, but definitely experience and and who the person is and, and you know what whether we like them as a person as well. So it's not just what's on a piece of paper or an experience. We actually want to meet the investor, uh, sorry, meet the um, developer and and get some confidence in them. Okay, so that's um, that's First, sponsor. Yeah, then the other, obviously, the the num number two would be the builder who's going to actually deliver this project and, and making sure they can actually we'll get to the end of the, the uh, development on time on budget. Um, and we do a lot of due diligence, probably more so now than the last few years. Um, that's one thing that has changed is actually. Um, drilling down, looking at their financials, looking at their capacity to deliver the project, um, looking at their cash flows, looking at their pipeline of deals, looking at their work in progress, looking at their debtors, um, just making sure they've got enough working capital to actually deliver this project. Um, that, you know, on some of the larger projects, it might be, you know, have they got the ability to put up a bank guarantee? Um, are they able to, you know, um, wear certain retentions along the way? Um, checking their references, speaking to valuers, speaking to QS, um, speaking to previous um, developers um, that they're billed for, that sort of thing. Um, so that's very important. Yep. Um, and in this current market, I think cash flow is is very important for um, you know making sure you've got a very experienced builder um, is going to is going to get a lot of these deals across the line, especially as pre sales um, are harder to get. Um, so therefore. At the end, if we've got um, residual stock that we know, at least we're going to get to the end. So, yeah. And so you look at order. look at their balance sheet. Um, like I said, their numbers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not it's not doing a full audit, but it's yeah. um, you know, both myself and Ben come from a chartered accounting background, so we love looking at financials and drilling down. So that, yeah. that excites us. Mm. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, we, we we I mean, it's it's more just to make sure that. Um, they're going to be able to finish our project. Um, and they might have ten different projects on the, on on the go, but we'll make sure that all our subbies are getting paid along the way. We'll go out on site, and you know, if we see something slow down, we'll find out what's going on. And if it means that we need to, you know, speak to the subbies directly and make sure they're getting paid, yeah. um, we don't want to get to that stage. So we want to make sure that they've got good project management skills. Um, they've got you know good site supervision, um, and they can you know they can deliver the project and keep working. You know, six seven days a week yeah and so this is a the question that i have and adrian's um popped it in the chat would you not need to have finance secured in principle before tendering to a builder uh, do, does the developer need to have the finance in place did you say yeah i mean um would you not typically have to apply for finance first before you go through that tendering process uh not i mean i mean it, 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 you, you might want to have to have that in if you're saying if the builder wants to make sure that you've got your finance approved is that what you mean um uh, i mean usually mm, not yeah, really but adrian from the developer's point of view yeah was that you speaking adrian no, no that was, that was no. ben that was ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah from, from the developer's point of view often yeah. often they they apply for finance you know when they've yeah. got while well, they're they've got plans and permits in place they're waiting yeah. for a da yeah. get everything sorted um before they even start tendering out for a builder yeah that's what so, yeah so no yeah. so so no i mean well i mean if we talk about some of the the deals we're looking at, at the moment we've got a guy that's come to us for finance so he wants to make sure that he can get his finance and we're getting mm. it indicatively approved you know as we speak um but he's, he's still finalizing who he's going to choose as his builder so yeah. Yeah. Um, he wants 
to make sure that you can get the finance, um, mm. but we're not going to probably provide a final um, unconditional letter of offer until we know who the builder is. We've got the QS to check it. We've done our evaluation. We've you know reviewed the pre-sales. Um, so there's, a, there's quite a bit of a process to go through. So yes, you, you want to know that the funding is going to be available, but it's very hard to actually give you a final um, so it's conditional letter of offer. Yeah. Conditional upon this, this, and this. Yeah. The, the benefit as well of getting a, a financier on board at that stage is that they can help assist with that process. Um, if if they haven't gone through the tender process, where from our point of view, you know, Michael and Daniel can guide uh, those developers down the right path um, for the most appropriate builder for that project. Um, and we, we recommended the builder on, on a Heidelberg transaction. We, um, they came to us for funding. They had a builder that they were deciding on. We said, we've driven past their site about 50 times, Mark, Daniel and I, and we said they were very they were slow, whatever, and maybe it was out of their control. Mm -hmm. We said, well, why don't you use someone else? And we brought the finance and the builder. So that's, that's the advantage of, of Lambda Capital as well. Excellent. A uh, few more questions here. Hypothetically, Sean's asking, if you find that a client is new and inexperienced, but the property they hold has great potential, can you point them in the right direction of a more confident builder if the builder that picked originally is found to be less suitable? Oh, right. That sort of answered that question answered as well. Only if we get the finance. <laughs> no, so in that case, in that case, it was a, a builder that we funded for a 38 apartment um, uh, development in Ringwood, um, and he was a pleasure to deal with. He actually didn't use any of his contingency. He um, delivered everything on time, on budget, um, very good quality, excellent in-house project management. Um, so we had no hesitation recommending him. And as Ben said, as as part of our finance offer. Um, we said, we don't think that the builder you've got is, is appropriate. Why don't you, you know, speak to this guy? And he came in, um, at a competitive quote. And I think they've, uh, saw some photos. Was it today? Maybe on the, the basement. So, so they're, they're getting into it quite well at the moment. So excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And, and, and another thing that you, you, uh, touched on Mark was if you're going to scale from and, and Daniel from Facebook said, going to scale from dual lock to six to 10 townhouses that can be bridged with a good development manager and solid build contract. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, it's, it's not all about um, the experience of the developer, but it's, it's really the team you have behind it. So it could be external project managers, could be internal project managers. Mm. Um, yes. Having a very good experienced builder um, does mitigate that risk. Um so yeah, like we have a checklist and we try to you know tick every single box on that checklist. But as Ben said right at the introduction, we're a bit more flexible than say a bank, and the bank might want every single one of their twenty points on the checklist. Mm. Um, you know, I worked at ANZ in corporate property, and they trained me on uh, how not to do a deal. But it was an excellent place to learn everything there is to learn about credit. Um, and all the guys at Lambert Capital, we we've learned from I guess from that sort of uh, corporate background. Um, but as we said, if we can, you know, tick nine out of the 10 boxes and mitigate the 10th, that that's, that's good enough for us. Mm -hmm. I also um, think as well, Cheryl, to add on to that, I think partnering with an experienced financier, I think that gets lost in the mix because you can have an experienced everything. If your financier is not experienced in, in, in construction, say it's construction, um, blending, um, you're going to become unstuck if they, because if they're just naturally asset lenders um, and don't understand obviously things go wrong with construction and you've got to change and you've got to things move it's a it's a moving based um, it's very important to have the right financier um, who's experienced in construction lending which which we are and that's a really important point because I think uh, to a certain extent you know uh, it stresses that not all lenders are the same no exactly uh, and, and having that experience, like you said, to be able to understand if the deals hit, um, you know, um, a bit of a, 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 a speed hump that that lender is aware and, and is able to uh, be versatile, yeah, yeah, as to how to, how to deal with that. You know, we've seen 
we've heard of people's profit being extremely eroded because they haven't got the right team behind them um, from a finance point. So, well, they've chosen the wrong um, the truck, the wrong lender, um, and they haven't read some of the uh, fine print. Mm. Which, which is what we do. Yeah. yeah, we we read every line in the letter of offer, and if we don't like it, um, we'll change it. What's an example of that when you mentioned, Mark, the fine print where uh, sure. a, yeah, where a developer's gone? Oh. So, um, I mean, sometimes we've lost business. Uh, other people would say that our rates are, you know, perhaps too high um, where they haven't actually read that. Um, one example is that the rate is actually a line fee and not on usage. So you're actually paying it on the limit. So they might be saying they think they're paying 8%, but it's actually based on the limit. So if you've got a, you know, a $5 million loan at, at 8%, you're paying $400,000 a year of interest as opposed to on usage, which should be on, mm. say, the average balance, yeah? So if, we, if ours is 10% on usage, that might be, you know, $300,000 of interest. So it can, it can make a big difference. Um, other things are people having their uh, letters of offer the, the actual rate might be um, 15%, but as long as everything goes well and you don't go into default, the rate is 10%. And then as soon as you go into default, you pay 15% from day one, for example. And they and they probably set you up to fail as well. Whereas, you know, a lot of our, some of our investors, um, they might have a clause in their, um, some of the fine print might be that they've got a, a clause they haven't told us about. And I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, there's actually a $13.50 monthly fee. So that's how honest they are. They're, they're, they'll tell you what the fine print yeah. is. So it's slightly different. But, um, but yeah, that, that's some of the examples that you, that you see. Um, other things are if you go into default towards the end and they might have a, you know, a 5% extra management fee that comes on top plus a, you know, a dollar figure that comes on top. Um, and we've just seen it recently with a, a client that we um, looked to fund maybe two years ago and it actually came back to us. Someone offered us the residual stock to refinance and the effective rate they were paying was, I think, well over 20% on the residual stock at the end. And that's that's the worst time to be paying it because that's when you're at your maximum at the at the peak of your loan, the peak debt. So, mm. And if mm. pre-sales are falling over, it's even worse. So, yeah, you've got to, you've got to be very careful to... To understand who you're um, who you're borrowing from. Yeah, um, and I've heard stories as well around lenders. Some lenders not quite acting particularly ethically, but like you said, setting you up to fail. Like mm. them knowing, you know, the here's the rate for the first mortgage, the mares, and it's literally, I think, overall might be eighteen eighteen percent um, spread. Which and and they know. That it's just a matter of time before the developers fall, you know, yeah. going to fall over. Another thing is also, I think, and um, Ben and I are on a call today with a with a developer who's looking at do some finance um, for the site in South Yarra, and we were just talking about it today and saying that um, whatever indicative terms we send out to you, that's going to be our pricing. It's not going to move, so I'm not going to get the valuation, get the QS report, and come back and then say, oh look. Um, we're going to have to drop the LVR and we're going to increase the interest rate. Whatever we quote, that's that's the rate. Yeah, so right. That's, that's also very important as well. So. Excellent. Um, I've got another question here on Facebook. Are you happy to review a single house luxury project in Sydney? Uh, how, how luxury are we talking about? What dollar value? Depends. I was going to say how luxury. Is it 10, so, million, 10 million luxury or...? So we have we have funded we have funded um, high end individual uh, is it construction we're talking about I assume is it I'm assuming he has it yeah so we, we have we have done um, individual um, luxury houses the issue we have there is that sometimes it's very hard to work out the valuation so um, you know is it is it a five million dollar end value is it a ten million end value you know if they spend six million they over capitalizing. Um, it's it's just a it's a bit of a higher risk, so we might have to um, lower the LVR. Um, that's just one of the issues we have with the that sort of one-off high-end um, home. But we have we have funded those before, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, can we talk on a high level the sort of um, 
LVRs that people, if they're doing their feasibilities at the moment and they're going, mm -hmm. well, I'm eventually going to go and get, let, you know, get my finance from, from Lambert Capital, what sort yeah. of numbers should they be putting into their feasibilities in terms of so LVR, you're talking about? L LVR rates, line fees, establishment fees, what other fees should they be um, factoring in? So for, for our private lending, I, I think in the last three to five years, there's probably um, none of our deals have been less than probably 8% for interest rates. Um, and then we, there'd be a mix of um, usage and line fees. So it might be um, today we were quoting rates, Ben, I think it was around 6 7%. Um, on usage and maybe two to three percent as a line fee, and then maybe a couple of percent up front as well as a establishment fee. Um, but it depends again on what LVR and what level of debt cover. So if it's a 55% LVR, then the rate will be lower than if it's a 70% LVR. If it's 80% um, mm -hmm. debt cover, um, you know, if you've got a $10 million loan, you've got $8 million worth of um, pre-sales, net of GST and selling costs, then that's that's you know, better than having no pre-sales, for example. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we, I, I did notice it was it was sort of last year where, where lenders were starting to go towards the the no pre-sale um, requirement. Yeah. yeah, and and but that's that since COVID, that sort of pulled back where we're wanting to see some pre-sales. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 also site specific, so it, it's it's probably a, a good point in terms of what do people think about the property market. So we often say, which property market are you talking about? Are you talking about apartments in Sydney? Are you talking mm. about townhouses mm. in Brisbane? Are you talking, you know, about a land subdivision in Perth? I mean, there's there's so many different asset classes that you need to look at, and every one of them has a little micro property market. So you might be saying, I oh, know it's um it's townhouses in Melbourne, and you say which suburb. And then which street, and which side of the street. So there's there's so many little um, you know answers as to as to what happens as to whether people will allow pre-sales or not. And then I guess it comes back to the matching process because different investors have different risk appetites. And if they you know they live in a suburb right next door to you, they might be willing to take that risk because they know that area very well. So our role is to match the investors to the right transaction. Yeah. So that, 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 that that's a that's a big thing. Um, in terms of pre-sales, yes, pre-sales. Uh, we talked about that affordable housing sort of space um, where people are getting you know, first-time buyer grants or uh, regional grants, that sort of stuff. Where um, you know, in that affordable sort of space, for example, you know, you can if you picture it, say the four hundred and fifty to seven hundred thousand dollar townhouse um, or house and land package for first-time buyers. Um, you're able to get pre-sales. Um, so um, a lot of people now, if they can't get pre-sales, we're seeing people come and pitch their deal to us and they're saying it's one of those um, build for rent or that sort of, they're, they're pretending they never actually intended to get pre-sales and they're always going to hold it. So it's, <laughs> that's one of the ones we've heard recently. So, um, but yeah. I changed my mind. Um. Yeah. Well, when they, they tried to, to try to get some pre-sales, they couldn't get us, and they pitch it back to it and say, no, we actually, we're, we're building to, to hold it and rent it out. I said, oh, okay. So. Righty, right. A um, few more questions coming through here. Uh, so if a project defaults, how does an investor get their funds return? And what's the typical time frame? Ooh, time frame is going to be a tricky one, but let's, let's start with the first. What so happens? If a, if a developer runs yeah. over time, you mean? Uh, uh, I think. I think it's more so if... for the investor to get their money back. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, there's a few things. One is um, if we, when we say default, it's usually merely just that the builder's taking a bit long to, to complete. Um, very rarely, that's that's probably the only time that the loan goes a bit over time. But then again, it's up to us to manage the extensions. So um, we fund on what's called a cost to complete basis. So if there's insufficient funds in the facility, so they've used up all their contingency or the interest capitalization we've held back has been um, used up, then it's up to the developers to actually put in the funds to complete the project, or we can put a second mortgage over the top to, to give them some additional funding, or um, in, the, in the case we've had recently, um, the uh, investor agreed to extend it for another two or three months. So, we, it's it's I guess called like a managed default, but mm -hmm. um, it's ne it's never really happened that anyone's actually lost any money because 
it's, we're pretty conservative and we've got a very thorough checklist. Um, so no, no one's ever lost capital or um, their interest on any of our um, senior debt MES type deals. Yeah, and, and you talk about also having a, a, a finance seer that understands development, in which case you've gone through when you understood sort of the risks that are associated with that sort of project already from the beginning. Yeah. So, and, and also if, it, if it's our money, um, you know, it's up to us to make that decision. We've had sometimes where investors need their money back. So we've stepped in and, and, and given them their money back, or if we've co-invested with other people, we're happy to pay them out. Um, sometimes it just happened on one of the deals that um, Ben and I are working on, um, where the investor said he wanted his money back, I think by September or something like that. So I said, well, I'm happy to um, put the $2 million in and give you your money back. And he goes, oh, okay, maybe I'll stay until December. So once he knew that we were happy to put our money in, then he thought, I oh, actually... Is he if, suffering uh, from FOMO? I think he said, if Greenberg's <laughs> happy to leave you, put the money in, then maybe I should stay in. So Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, Must be something good about the deal. Yeah, some, and a lot of the deals we co-invest as well. So if it's not just our money, then we're co-investing with our... Um, family office guys. A lot of them don't really want our money, but they like the fact that we've, um, you know, agreed to co-invest with them. Whether it's even the token five or ten percent, um, mm. we did that recently on a seven million dollar deal um, in um, where was that in uh, Portman? Oh, Williamstown, yeah, in Williamstown. Um, and so yeah, we co-invested with with um, a very large family office on that, um, and they just wanted to make sure that we were happy to put our money in with them. So. Excellent. Um, a few more little questions. One for Ben. Excellent. Um, ben, you mentioned that your rates have gone up lately. Is this more to do with the softening of the market in general or supply of capital has tightened up? Mm, good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I think there, there is more cash available. But I, I was probably specifically talking about construction lending with the investors in construction lending have shrunk because you've been able to supply demand, they've been able to increase their rates accordingly. For land settlements, there is a lot of cash available. And as Mark said before, um, funding for um, a 60, to say you bought a block of land in Caulfield, you wanted to settle it and you were going to build through townhouses on it, would, would give you say 65%. Um, and the rate would be circa 8% on that. Um, so that those rates are, are standing firm and, and quite well priced and haven't moved much on, on land settlements um, or investment debt or residual stock. There's more players in that game. Everyone's come out saying that they want residual stock, which means there's more competition for pricing. Um, but I was specifically talking about construction funding and it's the um, lack of uh, players in that in that market specifically in the non-bank space what's driven uh, pricing um, and the risk as well is slightly increased in terms of the pre-sales um, falling back um, and and investors being opportunistic I mean you know, do you want the funds or you know, do you, are you happy to wait for six months for the banks to stop dealing with COVID inquiries um, so um, I think that's 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 one of the, the reasons for the construction pricing. In saying that, it's a really good deal, which we've, we've just lent. Uh, we just did a thirty million dollar deal in Q, which was very well priced. It was six percent mine fee and a three six uh, percent on usage and a three percent mine fee, um, where you know other financiers were, were trying to charge them eight percent on usage and a three percent mine fee. So for good quality deals, that was in Q. Um, which had 80% debt coverage and a strong builder, um, there, is, um, there is still very competitive construction funding as long as you uh, get through the land of capital checklist. <laughs> Excellent. That, great question there. Uh, what was the and question? Kerry Car has asked, do you have a minimum loan amount? Uh, traditionally, it's probably in that 2 to $5 million minimum space. Um, especially for construction, um, there's a lot of work that goes into construction finance. Um, as I said earlier, the investment debt can be a bit lower. We've done you know, million dollar pieces. We've done second mortgages from 250, um, 850, uh, 1 million, that sort of size. Mm. 
yeah mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. it's not it's not really um it's more you know two townhouses up to probably um you know that 20 sort of townhouse sort of size is probably the, the right sort of size um, examples of transactions we've done recently were anything you know 5.6 million dollars um we did uh seven million dollars um four million dollar land which will now turn into construction funding um that sort of size is probably the the, the smallest sort of transactions at the moment okay yeah. um I, I did have a sort of final question here. And if you have any other questions in um, the wider group, feel free to, to add to them because we're probably coming up to the point of starting to pull, pull things back. Um, for people who are interested to become lenders, mm -hmm. um, again, if we can talk through sort of the, the minimum amounts that they'd be needing mm -hmm. and, and what they need to consider um, before sort of coming to have a chat with you or just even coming to have a chat with you to about becoming a lender? Yeah. So again, again, it comes back to um, the individual understanding their own risk profile, what they're, what they're comfortable with. So some people, as we said, might just want to put money into a first mortgage. Um, they can come invest with us or other um, high net worth guys, but um, you're probably looking at a minimum 500 to a million um, probably as a minimum investment. Um, but I would say, um, Ben, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think you'd, you'd want to have at least one to $2 million to make it worthwhile as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the smaller deals come, come about, but usually the smaller deals need a quick response. Um, so we tend to do those ourselves. If there's, you know, someone just needs a quick 200,000 or 500,000 or a million dollars, we'll do those ourselves. Um, but yeah, so. I mean, we, 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 can, we can look at smaller transactions if, if that's what people have to invest. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's probably, probably that million dollar plus. Mm -hmm. Sean's asked, were you nervous the first couple of times you lent out a million dollars? Um, that's a good question. I think that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mark's more of a... Uh, He's taught me to be more of a, a risk taker than probably what I was comfortable with. So he's, you know, you, you do get nervous and I was nervous. I'm sure Mark was, but uh, he, he doesn't show it. But uh, Well, it's about mitigating the risk. I mean, we're, 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 we are still chartered accountants deep down. Um, so we are pretty conservative animals. So we... Um, um, we are conservative. I mean, one of the tests that, that people often ask me um, is, and my father... Uh, Jeff, they say, would Jeff Greenberg invest in that? So that's one of the tests. They said, well, if you put your father's money into it, then I'll put my money into it. So that's that's one of the tests when it's our money, um, my family's money. Obviously, my father says the same thing back to me, like, you know, are you willing to risk your inheritance? That's the same. It works like ways. <laughs> so. <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah. I guess to answer the, the question, and we, we've become quite comfortable in doing a lot of due diligence. So when we say yes, um, as I was saying before, we we have confidence, um, and that's why we're confident in our lending because uh, not so much nervous anymore because we, we understand what the fundamentals of each deal, and we've stress tested a lot. Um, and we, you know, you you guys would be shocked at the amount of due diligence, conversation, strategy, workshopping. Um, bouncing ideas um, on, on every deal that, that we do do um, to make sure that it is the right deal for us and for our investor and for the borrower as well. Um, and, and that's why that nervousness is, is not there anymore because we, we're, we're, we believe and we're, we've done the, the work to justify. You say you put a million bucks in, put a million bucks in. If you guys want to put 30 million bucks in, I put 30 million bucks in. And because we've done the work, we've done the due diligence. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And so Sunil's asking if you have a team in Sydney. That's you, Cheryl, isn't it? That's it. We'll talk later. Wasn't it about outsourcing or something? Isn't that That's you? right. That's it. The exactly. Virtual, virtual well, does he want a job? Does he want to set up Lambert Capital in Sydney or what? what's the angle? <laughs> you don't bypass me yet. No, this is the yeah, gatekeeper not, not here. Front of Cheryl like that. That's right. 
<laughs> Mark and I go way back. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, don't hear, no, don't want to hear about that. No, excellent. Um, so uh, we've answered lots and lots of questions today. Thank you all so much um, for your time. Um, uh, keep up sort of the great work on the community. Thank you very much, Mark, as well. Um, everyone's always got questions about lending. If there's anyone that needs lending in Victoria, but where are the areas that you do lend? Where, what will you not lend on? So, so primarily it's Melbourne because our investor base is is primarily in Melbourne. So um, probably eighty percent of our deals will be Melbourne based, um, and then the rest we're looking at a deal in Adelaide at the moment. Um, we've looked at deals. We're looking at a deal in Queensland at the moment, up in Brisbane. Um, we have done deals in Perth, but nothing of recent times. So it's mainly that Melbourne and then probably Sydney, Brisbane has probably been the main lots. We've looked at some stuff in um, the Gold Coast, um, far north um, Queensland we've over the years, um, some stuff in northern New South Wales, but yeah, primarily it's Melbourne based. Some in Victoria, regional Victoria, we've done you know a few subdivisions um, commercial sort of stuff in that area as well. So, okay, fabulous. Yeah. Uh, if people need to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do so? Uh, you can go to lambertcapital.com.au. I'm not sure you the see back. it's on yeah, the back that's right it. now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Strategically no, placed. Here, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's working from home. But uh, yeah, so lambertcapital.com.au or um, you can call me on 04 Excellent, Tay. So expect lots of calls yeah, and um, emails. And, and yeah, and, and obviously um, Ben, Daniel and, and Michael in the office as well. So um, all, all happy to take your calls. Great. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, Sean says, great session, very informative. And take care. <laughs> Keep well. Where are all you. your... Wear all your mask and do whatever you need to. Um, but it's good to hear that that the the lending space is still healthy and well. Yeah. Otherwise, it's all positive. Yeah. It's all good keeping stuff. Positive under, under curfew, but but we we're uh, we're keeping positive down here in Melbourne. So. Oh, there you go. Don't, you, go Cheryl. don't don't you have a more fashionable one? No, <laughs> it's, I'm my, hoping it won't last that long. So I'm just trying to. Oh, I have to share. Um, I got a package today from the postie and it was a Rhodes and Beckett box. And I'm like, it was addressed to my husband. I'm like, he's going buying shirts. We're not even going anywhere. <laughs> um, so Rhodes and Beckett, as you know, they, they sell shirts and yeah. nice, you know. Always, yeah. And it's a box of masks. There you Ooh. go. There's okay. <laughs> like 300 masks. 300 bars. We're in Sydney, by the way. We've got we, three, we're not three to go that. We're, we're in curfew at eight o'clock, so we can't wear them out at night. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. You're going to bring out the Diamante one. <laughs> you can't wear a nightclub in Cheryl. Oh, dang damn it! All right, that's thanks, it. guys. Thanks, well, Cheryl. have a good hey, evening. Uh, we'll talk to you, you later. Cheers. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks bye. very much. Bye. bye.